Hello everyone and welcome to The Multiverse here on GraphicMultiverse.com. I'm your host Paul, joined with Rob. Hello there, Paul. Rob, it's been uh, a dog's age. It has been a few dog's ages indeed. Yeah, man. How you been? Busy. You know, work, babies, yeah, all that stuff. All of it. But you know, it's July, it's summertime, the living's easy. Yeah. Yeah, I uh I can't believe we're now we're halfway through the year of 2019. Blows my mind. It really does. And this year, I I we were just saying before we started recording, I would say that this is the year of end games. Mhm. Not just because of a, uh, you know, the Avengers film end game, but there just seems to be a lot of things coming to an end, especially the shocking news of The Walking Dead. I know. I remember our Dan and our like group message was like God damn it, Rob Kirkman. I'm like, oh, man, what did he do? What terrible thing did this man do? Oh, I know. I was nervous <laughs> then, that, he, that there was going to be some like sexual allegations coming seriously, out Seriously, I was him. like, oh, man, he seemed like such a nice guy. And then I like Googled Robert Kirkman, and the first news thing was just like, Walking Dead abruptly ends after, I don't even know, 2003, I think, is when the first issue came out. Mm, so like yeah. 16 years. Yeah, I did not see that coming. No, I don't think anybody did. I And, and, I, and I think that that it, it this is very Kirkman to be uh you know uh putting out uh an ending with um not a lot of fanfare around it there wasn't like like literally none I mean people it, are just like oh it's just the next issue I guess yeah which is like and I'll you know and I'm a little behind on The Walking Dead and that kind of makes me nervous because you know sometimes when you're reading something you can kind of feel where entering the end game so to speak yeah so i would just be bullshit if it was like wait what that's it like like i'm gonna be sad if they pull a sopranos where like i don't know fucking rick walks into a diner and then it's like black panels for like a page and then that's the end of the comic <laughs> yeah i i mean like i was just looking before to see like where i kind of last stood with walking dead issue wise mm -hmm. and i'm six trades behind and each trade is like f minimum four issues i'd say yeah five issues so i got like 30 some odd issues to catch up on Ugh. yeah and there's uh <laughs> you know it's funny because there's like a, there's a lot of really interesting books um coming out and you know and i and you know i was just going through lists of anticipated comics for um you know the remaining year and uh, End of the Walking Dead wasn't one of them, you know, because again, nobody, nobody knew that this show yeah, was coming what, to an end. Walking Dead is such like a, it's become something I've kind of like taken for granted almost. Yeah. Because I've always liked Walking Dead ever since, I guess, yeah, it came out in 2003. I think the first issue I have is like 14 or 15 or something. I just remember going to the comic store and asking the like guy at the comic shop being like hey what's what's going on what's good yeah <laughs> he's like oh you should read this book the walking dead like people love it it's really good and i was like okay so i think i like starting around 16 or 17 or something i started started reading walking dead and then um i kind of fell off for a bit but then i started getting the trades and kind of getting back into it yeah and yeah it's just it's always been there well, it's like uh it's like the old friend yeah well i mean because i mean this was the comic that that was sort of saying how that i mean i remember probably since the first issue that they had said that this was going to be like the the zombie comic that, that that's just going to keep mm -hmm. going just on go on forever yeah um and it's interesting because i was just saying about how you, know, you when you kind of feel like an ending is coming feeling that you're in the end game um and so I'm just reading this article from Polygon um, that in order to disguise that the comic was coming to an end, Kirkman and Adlard arranged with Walking Dead publisher Image Comics to advertise three more issues complete with cover art to retailers. This created the illusion that the series would continue until at least 
The Walking Dead issue 196 and presumably longer. And there's a quote from Kirkman. uh, Personally, I hate knowing what's coming. And I guess he wrote this in a letter at the end of uh, The Walking Dead issue 193. As a fan, I hate it when I realize I'm in the third act of a movie and the story is winding down. I hate, excuse me, I hate that I can count commercial breaks and know I'm nearing the end of a TV show. I hate that you can feel when you're getting to the end of a book or a graphic novel. The Walking Dead has always been built on surprise, not knowing what's going to happen when you turn the page, who's going to die, how they're going to die. It's been essential to the success of the series. It's been the lifeblood that's been keeping it going all these years, keeping people engaged. It just felt wrong and against the very nature of this series not to make the actual end well, sorry, yeah, not to make the actual end as surprising as all the big deaths from Shane all the way to Rick. Yeah. I didn't read the ending. Uh, I was like, well, I found a cool quote, and then I was like, oh, well, well, that's not the <laughs> spoiler for Rick. If it is, I'm sorry. But yeah, that's walking crazy. Did. It is crazy. I'm just like... I can imagine from, especially from like the comic book retailer side, all of a sudden it's just like, oh wait, like our most popular comic book is just, just gone now. <laughs> well, especially if if you know, if you're you know, I, I would love to kind of get Angela's standpoint on this. The fact that like that they, you know, that they were arranging, you know, and advertising three more issues coming out, and the fact that they even got like cover art. And this is, like, going to retailers. I mean, like, that's crazy. But yeah. But at the same time, though, um, hats off to them for that level of dedication to the secrecy. Yeah, I can, I can respect that. Respect the game. That's just, it's so nuts. Y- yeah. And uh, I don't know. I think in some ways, um, I don't know, because I remember, like, saying before that, kind of having that feeling that Walking Dead's got to wrap up at some point. Because I remember thinking, like, how long can this go on? Because, you know, as Kirk- much... Kirkman had said, like, he pla- he planned on writing it forever. Basically, he was just like, this is the book I'm just going to work on forever. It's always going to be there. Yeah. I wonder if the level of pressure there is to having to constantly making sure that you have surprises coming out, you know, because you never want to, mm-hmm. like, do it just for the sake of shock and awe, you know? And then I, I wonder if maybe he saw an end point that, that, you know, that maybe that this is this is all I can say, these are all the surprises I can have, while let's end it now while it still feels fresh and organic. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm very, very interested in catching up now. Yeah. So I definitely plan on cranking through all those issues i'm behind mm-hmm. but um yeah i'm I'm so curious how that book wraps up same because he i mean like yeah it's like you were saying a lot of people think there's some like repetition and it, parts of it got old but i feel like just for like a creator-owned story with such like a i don't know like i that's one of the few books that's ever like literally made my jaw drop while reading it. Oh yeah, like, for sure. Just like some of the deaths that happen in that book, like I literally like mouth agape, and I was just like, "What?" Yeah, no, no. I mean, and and I and I agree, you know. And I don't want to belittle the the like the the story because, you know, I I I feel like it broke away from a lot of the tropes of the zombie sagas, and uh, mm-hmm. I just think once we had gotten through the turmoil wrought by the governor and then to get Negan, I think so close together, it sort of, it, it kind of felt just a little rehashy to me. And then, you know, and then when they had Negan and then the, the last I left off was they had Negan as like a prisoner in their community there. And, and but for the most part though, I mean, you know, even despite that though, now that I'm looking back on it, I, I'm still okay with, you know, uh, when they found that little abandoned community, and then they were kind of warring with Negan, uh, you know, about what was it that they had to like kind of give him a percentage of what they had. I feel like that was so like very realistic, and I can see that in a post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. setting. Um, and I did like all of the 
the surprises. I, I think, you know, just, I think like anything, I think sometimes maybe like you just needed a break. It was sort of like, I was kind of getting annoyed with Walking Dead the same way I was getting annoyed with Game of Thrones. It was like, once we got through Joffrey, oh look, here's Ramsey Bolton, here's another fucking punk kid asshole. And it's like, didn't we just mm -hmm. have one of these? And while Ramsey was <laughs> a way worse villain than Joffrey was, it just sort of, I just didn't, I, I guess not understanding the need for it, why it's, you know, it just, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm just too picky with my fiction, but now yeah, I, I want to go back and, and check out Walking Dead. I definitely need to go back and read. I remember, so, I think I read the trades for, like, the first seven, and then I jumped over to single issues for, like, a hundred straight issues or something like that, but it got to the point where that book, for one thing to give it for sure, is that it was consistent. Like, it always came out on time, it seemed. Like, yeah. that book was never delayed. So, I would read, like, one issue of Walking Dead, and it reads in, like, five minutes. Like, those, you can rip through an issue of Walking Dead, like, nothing. Mm -hmm. So, then I went back to reading it in trades, because I just think it reads better in trades. I think the longer form, it's just better for it, because it reads so quickly. Right. So, now that I have 30 issues to read, maybe I'll just, I'll just try to crush it in, like, a week on the train or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sad to see it go, uh, but again, I, I give Kirkman a lot of credit for just how he's, um, the level of secrecy, um, and yeah, it's, I... It's crazy, in in 10 years, I remember in 2008, I was at San Diego Comic-Con, there was a Walking Dead booth, in, like, as part of the Walking Dead, or as part of the Image Comics booth, and they just had, like, the poster for the TV show, like, the TV show hadn't come out yet, and there was, like, two people in line, and Robert Kirkman was just sitting there. And, like, I walked up and, like, got him to sign some stuff. He even drew me a sketch of Invincible because the person in front of us asked him for a sketch, and I thought it was funny to have a writer draw me something. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, now if he's at Comic-Con, like, Walking Dead is probably, like, a third of the floor. Like, it's a friggin' cultural tent pole at this point. Yeah. I remember holding the first issue in my hand, and, boy, am I kicking myself for not buying it. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I... Uh... Kirkman, I think, is one of my favorite comic book writers out there. Um, because, you know, while I fell off Walking Dead, um, man, my love for Invincible was always strong. Just because I, I love what he did for that comic. But we'll have to maybe save that for another day. Maybe we can do an, an Invincible episode. I would love to. That would force me to finish it. Yeah, and maybe maybe even doing a... Maybe we should do, like, a uh, an, an End of the Walking Dead episode. I'm down. When you have time, you know. <laughs> once i get through it yeah yeah um but no that could be that could be cool but speaking of comics i know there's there's a lot of big stuff uh coming out this this year i don't know as i was saying we're halfway through the year now um i'm so excited for jonathan hickman's return to marvel mm -hmm. because his fantastic four uh his avengers you know even um even um secret wars that was pretty good yeah I feel like his Avengers has like a special place in my heart as well because I feel like it kind of went along with like the birth of this podcast. Yeah. I feel like as we started doing this podcast, that was when I was like actively trying to read as many comic books as possible and I was reading so much Hickman stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very excited. Uh, and, and, and I think what makes me more excited is that... It's X-Men? Yes. <laughs> I mean, and I love, I have a very special place in my heart for X-Men. And so, and while I would be happy with Hickman fucking writing Howard the Duck, but the fact that he's writing X-Men is, ooh, ooh, oh, that's going to be good. That's going to be good. And I guess it's, he's, um, he's kicking off X-Men with, a, it's going to be two six-issue miniseries. There's the House of X and powers of x so i'm excited that's going to be uh you know two mini series um and i think and i and, I, and, I, and i'm hoping from there it's gonna be a um you know a nice run yeah. of uh i Hickman have tried i have tried to get back on x-men like so many times in the past i'm trying to think I think the last time I like regularly followed X-Men was around like X-Men versus Avengers. Like Scott Summers was still alive okay. before he was alive again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then like I, I went 
back and I read a lot of like the red, blue, gold series is like the first See. half a year of those and stuff. And I just, nothing has grasped me like and pulled me back in but this just knowing it's Hickman I'm so ready well you know and that's actually uh, what you were just discussing is actually sort of what kind of inspired me to go back to 1963 and read the Lee Kirby X-Men because I mean boy it takes a long time but that is the ultimate catch up just just going Mm -hmm. through everything um and yeah and and I I, and the X-Men you know deserves to be in the hands of somebody like Jonathan Hickman especially now um we need good X-Men books just you know especially considering what's happening in our political climate but again save that for another episode but yeah Hickman's gonna be great um there's also kicking off um this month if it hasn't already um Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen they're getting their own books um um I guess because the you know Brian Michael Bendis who while I love wasn't a fan of what he did with X-Men. There were pockets that I liked, but um, now that he's over at DC, um, there, there's going to be two events spinning out of his uh, Leviathan event, um, mm-hmm. and it's going to be like a Jimmy Olsen and a uh, Lois Lane comic, which Bendis just does great work with like street level, like like. The writer of Jessica Jones writing Lois Lane gets me very mm-hmm. excited because I think that's it a make, good fit. It makes sense. Oh, totally, totally. Um, also, like if you just look at the, uh, the, I think they released the cover art for it. Yeah, it just looks. It almost looks like Alias. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it's got uh, you know it's got some talent behind it. I mean, because Greg Rucka. Um, who did like Gotham Central? I loved mm-hmm. his Wonder Woman. He's doing this, um, and uh, and then and then uh, Matt Fraction, who wrote some of my favorite comics, like his run of Iron Man, his Hawkeye run, Sex Criminals. He's doing uh, Jimmy Olsen with uh, Steve Lieber, um, and I guess the the t- the full title is Superman's Pal Jimmy Olsen, um, <laughs> which uh, I'm excited about. Jimmy's come a long way, you know, especially because his only uh, function in the series was for the radio show. Yeah, and just to be just to be spun out of the radio show. Yeah, just so Superman could fucking talk to somebody. Um, And I guess um, um, let me see here. Trying to think what else. Oh, 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 and. there and I'm very excited for this. There is a new mutants comic coming out, um, and it's called New Mutants War Children. Uh, it's not coming out till September, uh, but it's called. Um, well, I, I I said what it was called. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> New Mutants War Children, but it's written by Chris Claremont. For those of you bringing them back, bringing exactly. them back their dad. Can you hear this jackass outside? <laughs> Is that a yes? Not really. Okay. Um, then you can edit that part out. Um, <laughs> so I had to have the window open because it's so goddamn like muggy. But um, and I guess what I think is interesting about this is that this is uh, it's not um, how, how do I want to say this? It's not. Um, like a new mutant series for modern day new mutants is actually set in the era that they wrote new mutants it's almost like a missing chapter it's the same artist too isn't it bill sinkowitz yeah sink sinkowitz you know what? i give you a lot of credit because i was so fucking scared to say his name <laughs> you know, like because i was like oh i'm gonna mess this up but yeah but it's gonna be with like magic wolfsbane cannonball cypher um mirage karma and sunspot um, his his covers just like bring me back oh yeah to just flipping through long boxes of old comics because the new mutants always had such like cool covers right and i didn't really go back and read until i was a little older but like that book is so good and the art is like is so good <laughs> yeah it's it's um it's very modern mm-hmm. i think um 
you know, as I mentioned earlier about rereading X Men, you know, that forced me to kind of to you know go into New Mutants territory, um, and in in rereading that, um, it gets me excited and nervous for the movie it, because I obviously want the movie to be good. I don't think it will, but um, New Mutants is is I think it's just such a it was such a great idea for, you know, Xavier being like, you know, maybe I'll try to train these mutants and maybe train them to not go to war. Mm-hmm. And, and 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 their adventures you know, taking them elsewhere. Yeah, honestly with those movies I'm kind of I just want them to end quickly and quietly. Yeah. So Marvel can just start brewing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, as do I. I want it to be good, and so far, um, you know, um, pretty happy with everything Marvel has done has done thus far. Um, so we'll see where it goes. Um, but yeah, those are kind of like kind of the I I don't know, kind of the big things that are coming out for me since uh, you know we were talking about Walking Dead and um, not being on this list of anticipated comics that are coming out for the rest of the year. Because again, this is the year of End Games. This was big news. Um, Mad Magazine. Is done, and yeah, which um, is another like cultural staple. Yeah, I mean, and it was a. Yeah, it's just. I mean, I feel like Mad Max was just such a a cultural touchstone, and I grew up reading Mad Magazine, and I, and I I remember having my books. I had Mad about the fifties. Mad about the sixties, the seventies, eighties. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm just so bummed because I love, uh, I love Mad Mags. And that, that was part of my comic book roundup, you know. And in, God, I mean, that was this, and that Mad started in 1952, and it was a, it was a comic book, and then in '55, it switched to a magazine format. Yeah, I don't know. So, like... In 67 years. I know, that's crazy. I mean, I'm not going to lie and say I've been reading it, because I have not. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. And I feel Um, bad about that. Yeah, and like most things that are dying, I'm equally part of the reason they're dying. But, yeah, it's just it's sad to see stuff go. Mad Magazine is one of those things where there's a small period in my, like, early teens where I would pick it up occasionally um, but I was always more fascinated with just kind of like its impact on culture and it's basically like prevalence. You know, it's just always been there. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it's one of those things that when there's inevitably like an in-depth documentary about it, I'm going to be super into it. Oh <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it's just funny because I mean, I, you know, I, I mean that man magazine, like it, it's like a textbook for satire for me. It taught me what it was. Mm-hmm. It, it, it taught me it, you know, spoofing movies, politics, um, and it's crazy. And what's interesting too is that and I didn't know this until now. Just doing some quick research, Mad is part of the the DC Comics group, owned by Warner Brothers, um, mm-hmm. and DC just they just recently canceled Vertigo, didn't they? They sure did. Oh man, what the fuck, Rob? Why? Is, <laughs> I why did no one tell me 2019 was going to be the end game year? And I mean, I guess canceling Vertigo is more of just like a it's more just like a bummer because I mean you don't necessarily need multiple imprints to put out the comic books that you would put out under that imprint I guess but it's like some of my favorite comics of all time have been Vertigo comics oh yeah especially there was like there's the 90s Vertigo stuff like Sandman Hellblazer just the various like DC comics kind of like adjacent stuff Mm -hmm. i guess um right but then you have why the last man Uh, in the 2000s which is one of my if not my favorite comic book of all time you've got stuff like scalped which is just like if anybody hasn't read scalped and you're into like grounded realistic like almost not true crime obviously but just like crimes comics it's freaking incredible yeah and it was just like a a cool like creator owned world 
Yeah. That's where Fables was as well, too. Fables was a Vertigo book, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, you had, uh, I mean, well, there was like, Amer- there was like a, I know America, American Splendor kind of fell in their uh, umbrella, American Vampire. Mm-hmm. Um, the I know they have Books of Magic. Uh, I'm trying to think of like the, I'm actually just kind of looking at my bookshelf um, for, I mean, there was DMZ, um, but yeah, Fables. Uh, yeah, even more recently, like Scott Snyder's Awake came out mm-hmm. under Vertigo. I wonder if that's why Snyder kind of jumped over to Image, because there's no real creator-owned yeah. support. Right. And then you had Hellblazer. Oh, um, The Invisibles, iZombie. Uh, yeah, Jonah Hex was part of the uh, Vertigo uh, for a little bit. Lucifer. Um, man, this is like... No, I'm just like kind of getting a little more <laughs> depressed. I mean, of course, yeah. Then and then there was. Uh, let me see here, preacher. Oh yeah, who can freaking? I'm I'm kind of surprised myself that I forgot about preacher. Uh, and of course, yeah, Sandman. Um, Swamp Thing, Alan Moore's Swamp oh, Thing. Oh man, Astro City, Sweet Tooth. Yeah, it's just so many just solid ass comic books coming out under vertigo i mean hopefully the creator owned kind of stuff just kind of slides over to image or dc just releases it under the dc title and hopes people realizes that it's not part of like the superman continuity but i feel like it's just you know so many so many good things <laughs> under that umbrella yeah ah oh, sad sad but but with vertigo i mean are they is it and i mean i it's not like all the stuff they've released is going to disappear i'm sure it's just their dc is no longer like the imprint of vertigo is no longer continuing yeah well, I mean, but I'm hoping that, like, you know, you can still, like, buy Vertigo comics. It's not like, you know, like, like oh, why I'm the sure. last I mean, man trade is going to be hard to find. With, with and... a Sandman TV show coming out on Netflix, do you think they're not going to try to reprint oh God, yeah. all of Neil Gaiman's Sandman? Yeah, and you know what I, I liked about Sandman? And, and Sandman is something I haven't finished yet, um, but I knew, I read it knowing nothing about Sandman. Um, yeah same here and uh but i was sort of taken aback by how connected it is to the dc universe i mean like there's there's, the scarecrow was in one of the um in one of the earlier arcs and uh um and i love how like even now i mean um sandman made an appearance in the dc metal event so that was cool um and i'm really excited that neil gaiman is writing sandman for netflix um because lucifer which also was a vertical comic that gaiman worked on was on netflix and gaiman is actually even in one of the episodes he's the voice of god um and so that kind of gets me excited about how um salmon's gonna be into um you know I guess kind of bringing that world to life, and and I and I think Sandman as a, as a serial is a good way to go. I was worried when they were doing a Sandman movie, but I think as a serial it could be really interesting, and it's going to be also. I guess he's doing this with David Goyer, who, um, you know, big claim to fame there was you know the working on Chris Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. Hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm super curious just to see like visually how they bring this to the screen because mm-hmm. it is so like unique and just I don't even like not whimsical but fantastical I guess just it's I don't know it's about a friggin dude whose world is all dreams and like visually that is a very cool thing <laughs> oh yeah well, it's interesting that, I mean, I always kind of like the start where, you know, it's like these, like, fucking rich occult dudes who are trying to, like, summon a god, and, and they and they capture the Sandman by mistake, and, and so there's just, like, mm-hmm. decades of turmoil that's kind of come around with the Sandman not doing his 
his job. Um, and so I think, and then the same man coming back and having to kind of rectify what's been done, um, um, is, um, is such a neat concept. And I think it's something that has aged well, the, the gorgeous art. Um, and I just love the kind of no holds barred storytelling that, that, that came with it. Um, and I, and just knowing that Gaiman is going to be an executive producer. Um, and I guess he's writing the first episode, um, with, uh, David Goyer, as well as, um, Alan Heinberg, who, interesting background, um, Grey's Anatomy, um, so, but you know what, I mean, the Russo brothers were doing comedies before they got on, on, on Marvel, so, who knows, but I, I think game is I mean, involved, involved. I never watched Grey's Anatomy, it seemed very popular, it's probably good to have somebody who's familiar with, like you said, serialized television and stuff like that so right yeah so do you remember when um um fucking hammering you sure you can't hear that i can kind of hear but it just sounds like two people having sex on a comedically springy bed oh (laughs) well that's a way better image than what's actually happening um um fuck that dude hammering out my 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 thought well what was it i don't talk about sandman (laughs) Fuck. Well, anyway, Sandman, super excited. Oh, now I got it. Uh, remember when Joseph Gordon-Levitt was attached to Sandman at one point? He, he was going to be yeah. in the movie? That was like, what, like five or six years ago, probably, if not more. But yeah, I definitely remember that. I think he was going to star, and I was like, I don't I don't see him as Sandman. So, nothing against him. I think he's a good actor, but... Mm, not Sandman. Yeah. Definitely not. I don't know who I would picture as that character, but get an unknown, man. Yeah, get an unknown. Go back to those days, like you know, because the great thing about having unknowns playing beloved pop culture parts is that you, I feel like you believe it. It's not like oh, I'm looking at Ben Affleck as the Sandman. You know, you it's mm-hmm. it's. Yeah, I don't know. It was like the beauty of like Chris Hemsworth. I the only other movie I'd seen him in was Kirk's dad in Star Trek. So when he's walking around as Thor, like a part of me was like, I was buying him as Thor because I couldn't relate him to anything else I had seen. I mean, so many of the Marvel characters, like Tom Holland, never saw him in anything. Mm-hmm. Chris Hemsworth, never really saw him in anything. Chris Pratt. I mean, well, I mean, he had Parks and Rec, but I, I feel Chris, like... Yeah, Chris Pratt, they basically took somebody you recognized and just completely transformed him. Right. But I will say, every time I see Chris Evans, is always not another teen movie. Yeah. Yeah, like it's uh, J.D. Detweiler in a Cast America outfit. But, to Chris Evans' credit, uh, fucking killed that part. Sure did. And uh, that's, that's, that's my cap. Yep, no, and it's funny, because I... Have you seen Sunshine? I have. Like when I saw that, uh, I was like, "Wow, this 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 dude can act." And then when I heard he was Captain America, and everyone's like, "Oh, dude from another teen movie and, and Fantastic Four. And I'm like, "No, watch Sunshine. Dude can play a leader." But yeah. But that being said, uh, someone who has either done little to no acting, not well, you know what I mean. Like not yeah, don't, just, just don't get up again and like an A lister. That's all I request. I'm down. I'm down to see it. Net- Netflix is one of those things where I'm always just like, hmm, I wonder if I should cancel it and just get Disney Plus. But then I like turn on Netflix and it's like, oh, there's a new season of Dark. Oh, there's new Stranger Things. Mm-hmm. Oh, I guess I guess I'm keeping it. <laughs> yeah, no, they Netflix has got some quality content. Um, you know, and, and that's nice. That's the beauty of Netflix. It's not like it was, you know, Marvel was the only thing holding them up. Um so to speak so yeah a lot of good shows and of course glow i love glow can't wait for I that think to I've, come back. I've only seen enough a little bit of glow oh you gotta watch it man it's up most of the first season and i i did enjoy it quite a bit yes it's very good it's very good um i'm trying to think what else has been happening in the world of um comic books well there's also um and speaking of acting um paul rudd apparently is going to be in ghostbusters and it's not and and i guess it's not going to be the kristen wing ghostbusters it, it's sort of like a um 
it's going to be like a sequel to the original. Yeah, thank you. Words. Yeah, which I'm very excited about. I was not upset, obviously, that it was just a bunch of women last time. I was more upset that it didn't capture kind of like the tone and like what made the original Ghostbusters so good. Well, I just didn't like that it was like a reboot. Like, it, yeah, it was it was a reboot, and it was more of like a I don't know. It was more of just like a lowbrow comedy. I think what took what made the first one so good is that it just took itself completely seriously, and they even like filmed, directed, and everything. It was completely seriously, but having comedic actors and stuff just be witty and hilarious also made it hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, I'm I'm very excited to to see if well you know and it's I, jason jason reitman's directing it isn't yeah he? yeah so he's kind of like stepping into his dad's shoes to keep it in the family <laughs> right um yeah and i and i just love that the entire cast is coming back so gorney weaver's gonna be back in it um mm-hmm. and i totally buy um um that Paul Rudd, I mean, he's like the everyman, you know. So I feel like he could be like the like the next generation of like um, you know, like like um Peter Venkman. Er- yeah, I was gonna say like the Ernie Hudson because Ernie Hudson was the everyman in the first Ghostbusters, but <laughs> uh, I guess yeah. But yeah, no, they'll, they'll make Paul Rudd. I don't know. Will they make him like some weird ghost dude? Like he's just super into ghost busting. Yeah. <laughs> Um. Yeah, he's in. I'm trying, trying to think. Of John Violent Negotiations. Jason Reitman. Uh, uh. Let's see here. Yeah, I guess the details are. Uh, all we know, and this is according to Io9. All we know right now is that he's he be playing a teacher. Uh. So that's that. That's all we get, but I'm just happy he's in it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm always down for Paul Rudd. Think they're gonna get Rick Moranis back? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Cause, cause I've heard he's like, like he's just he's just done. Yeah, I, I know he basically completely retired after but, his like wife passed away or something. Yeah, but uh, but in some ways though, you know, um, I hope that wherever he is, he's happy. And um, I think him not coming back, I think it kind of preserves the memory of his character exactly (laughs) exactly who was like my favorite movie character wasn't that like one of your halloween costumes one year it was going to be i wanted to get like the pasta strainer and like put a bunch (laughs) of nonsense on it and just like run around people asking if they're the gatekeeper (laughs) yeah that would have been fantastic um yeah rick rick moranis good guy oh yeah yeah big big fan of rick moranis Mm -hmm. yeah so i think um i you know i think it's uh um you know i I, yeah sadly we won't be seeing mr tully uh but i think seeing the other characters and where they are and especially like i said with paul rudd kind of being cast and leading the charge for the new generation so to speak will be interesting um and then speaking of casting there's the uh, um, the casting announcement that Disney made for Little Mermaid, um, Halle Bailey. I, I, I that's that's a tough name because I'm. Uh, I was I was one of the billions of people who thought they said Halle Berry and was just like, seems a little old to play a 16 year old, but all right, bold choice. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a sequel, but yeah, Halle Bailey officially been cast as Ariel in Disney's live action The Little Mermaid. And um, I have to say, I'm I, I'm not familiar with her work, but she is cute as a button. And I don't know if she can sing, but if she can sing, then fuck, I'm all for it. Yeah, I mean, she looks like a little Disney princess. <laughs> Seriously. Um, let me see here. Yeah, I have not seen a single thing she's ever been in, but uh. Yeah. But let's see here. Um, I'm just trying to do a quick research. Um, she was in some Beyonce music video. Yeah, I was just seeing that. Yeah, for the groundbreaking self-titled 2013 album. 
Uh, oh, so she can sing, yeah, that first line of Bailey's, uh, Bailey's music contract with Parkwood Entertainment. So, so she can see, that's all I need. That's all I need. Because, you know, I was talking to some people. Luckily, these people weren't upset about, uh, yeah, I guess, spoiler alert, Hallie Bailey is black. And, um, and, and my thing with these parts is that, one, um, the race. They're taking, they're taking our redheads, Paul. Oh, Jesus. First Mary Jane, now Ariel. <laughs> yeah, and there's probably, there's probably some jackass out there who's trying to prove with science that mermaids are Caucasian. Um. Exactly. But, um, I said the only thing I care about, you know, um, is that the person can act and they can sing. Singing's key. Uh, I mean, obviously, lip sync, whatever, but preferably, you know, let's get somebody who can, who has talent. Because because Ariel is not a character whose race is dependent on the story. You know, it, it's not like um, like, like there's, yeah, a, re- she's, there's a reason. By race, you mean she's a mermaid? Right. That's important, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's not the like, region of the Earth in which that mermaid came from is not important, right? Yeah, like it doesn't really matter. It's not. I mean, like. You know, like, I, like I've always said before, like there's a reason why certain characters, like their race, is important. Luke Cage, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, T'Challa. You know, there's a reason why those characters have to be black, and if they weren't, then people totally have a right to be upset. Or even Captain America. And let me let me rephrase that: Captain America can be black. Steve Rogers has to be blonde haired and blue eyed. You know, there's you know. Uh, the, you know, but other characters, no, it's not, a, it's not, it's not a essential to it. So the fact that she can sing, I mean, for Christ's sakes, if she was like in a in a in a, in a Beyonce album, I'm there. And I, and I guess she was yeah. also on Grown um Grown ish, which I'm gonna have to check that out now. Uh, oh, she recorded, she recorded the theme song for Grown ish. Nice. And I also like the new that that I guess this hasn't been confirmed yet, but um, Melissa McCarthy apparently is in talks to play Ursula. Ooh, that could work. Yeah, I've seen all the people, the memes people have made of uh, Terry Crews playing Captain Triton or King Triton, and I was like, I'd be so down for that. Yeah, <laughs> I I've seen Terry Crews, and the other one I've with the other Photoshop I've seen it was uh, Idris Elba, which that's tough. That's a tough call because I love both of those men. Yeah, to, I and guess I don't care how gay vibe that which, I fucking or, <laughs> love those. Yeah. How how they want to play that yeah. relationship? Terry Crews might be a little much. Well, yeah. Not that uh, Idris Elba wouldn't be too much in the other direction. Right. Yeah. But um, yeah. I don't know. You know what? Fuck it. Get them both in the movie. Mm-hmm. Get them wet and shirtless with mermaid tails. Yeah, whichever one isn't the king can just play uh like Sebastian. <laughs> I support that. I support that 100%. I guess, yeah, you could have like Idris Elba play Sebastian instead of a Jamaican crab. He's a British crab. Yeah. That's like, I, I, I could just hear it now like, like, like down where it's wetter, down where it's better, under the sea. <laughs> Being all intense. It's a much darker Little Mermaid. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah, I think it's exciting. I, I, and I just see the thing with me is I just wish I had any real interest in seeing these live action remakes. Yeah, I'm right. I'm right there with you on that. Um, because it, it's it has nothing to do with the Little Mermaid or the casting. I've I have not seen a single one of these live action. They just there's nothing about them really makes me want to see it. Yeah, I've only seen Jungle Book, and I like Jungle Book, but 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 I think John Favreau, you know, he. He's such a a great and established director that um, I don't know. I was into it. I thought he was great. Um, you know, making this film. Otherwise, you know, I I, I wasn't excited about Dumbo. Um, I wasn't really super excited about Aladdin. Um, I think because I feel like that these movies they're kind of already perfect. So why do we need to? You know, and, yeah, and pe- also people have said it's to like keep the copyright or something, or just make more money with maybe a little bit of needing both. to come up with the script. My thing is Which, this. And, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was gonna say I don't. I, it's just I love hand drawn animation. Mm. 
Yes. So it's keep it's hard up. for me to just keep like keep pushing it further and further away because we haven't had a Disney hand drawn film since The Princess and the Frog, I think. Yeah, and that was fantastic. I loved I know. how that looked. Yeah, I, I I wish that they would stick with that because um, I thought that that was a great movie and beautiful animation. You know, and that's the thing is that with all of the advancements, I mean, yeah, you can do computerized stuff, but you know, there's a lot that you can do with the hand drawn animation to just to kind of give it that little extra, you know, because because uh, mm-hmm. some of the animation, well, not some, all. Let's be real, Disney's animation's been sorry. Flawless. I thought, I thought I was going to throw up. I just get so worked up about talking about Disney animation. It, it makes me physically ill. That's dedication and love. Um, but yeah, I, I yeah, I wish there was more of that. Um, and also, I, and and just for anybody who's listening, can you stop saying that the Lion King is live action? I know because it, it's just <laughs> it's it's it, I mean it's photo realistic CG. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what's the term? Is it uh, uh, photo realistic? It's like yeah. it's like photorealistic animation. It looks real. It's not. These aren't lines that they've cast. They held auditions for. If it was live action, I would go see that movie because that would be one of the most impressive cinematic feats of all time. I, yeah, maybe if it was like Homeward Bound, you know, where they're filming live animals and they just have like guest, you know, guest star performances voicing yeah. over the. Then I might be a little more inclined to see it. A little more. But I don't know. I mean, like, like, and I love the Lion King. Like, I love, and I think the only the smart thing that Disney did with this remake is um, bringing back James Earl Jones because no one else could be Mufasa. No one. Mm-hmm. No one. Yeah, it's such a such an iconic voice. <laughs> no one could do it. You know, nothing against you know other black actors who have beautiful deep baritone voices but come on James Earl Jones I mean he is Mufasa there's no way anybody else could play that part and even if someone could I don't want to hear it because it, James Earl Jones is Mufasa and he's I also think I think uh, John Oliver being cast as Iago is pretty or not Iago uh, fucking what's his name the toucan Oh yes, yes, yes. I know here's uh, no, 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 I'm drawing a blank there. The, little, um, the blue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lion um, King bird is what I'm googling. Zazu. <laughs> yeah. No, I think uh, uh, there's a there's a funny exchange between him and Trevor Noah. How I was like, you know, I'm actually from Africa, and they cast this white <laughs> British dude. Like, I'm not in the Lion King, but you are. It was kind of. <laughs> um, but yeah, but you get you got Keegan Michael K, Donald Glover, Seth Rogen, um, uh, she will Asia Four. I think I learned that name. Shoot, shoot, tell Asia Four. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I know. I know you're saying it's just the hardest name to pronounce for. Yeah, us simpletons. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, I love that a- a- Amy Sedaris is in it. Uh, you know, you got Beyonce, Billy Eckner. I mean, yeah, it's a pretty. I mean, it's a pretty great voice cast. Uh, voice cast. Um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't it's know. one of those things that if I'm on a plane and that's randomly the only thing I can watch, I'll watch it. That's uh, that's actually how I saw Beauty and the Beast, and I barely got through that. I, you know, I like wanted to like Beauty and the Beast because I thought some of the casting they did is, you know, did a pretty good job of kind of capturing, like they were able to cast people who who looked as much as the cartoon as they could yeah but i just i fucking love beauty and the beast like the original yeah and when i saw stills of like miss pots and stuff looking like this creepy ass freaking pot with a face i'm like god i don't want that <laughs> <laughs> i don't want nightmares disney i know i just want this nice sweet little old lady pot <laughs> yeah but yeah i just kind of i don't know i'm still sad at the lack of animated films, not animated, hand drawn animated right. films. Cause like, it's like a, it's a craft that literally the people that are like really good at it are like still alive. They're getting older now, but it's like, but that's something we need, we need them to like hand it off. Like right. we gotta keep it exactly. alive. That, exactly. That is an art that needs to do to, to continue to be celebrated. Um, yeah, and I, I understand that it's like 
super expensive, super labor intensive, it hard. Is, it's it's just fucking long. I mean, yeah, I, but like if think about it, if we got one beautiful hand drawn movie every seven to ten years, I'd be okay with that just to yeah. keep it going. Well, I mean, if you start now. You you line up. I mean, I'm. I mean, and you can you can do all your Disney Pixar stuff all you want. Like I'm I'm excited for Toy Story four. Can't wait to see it. Um, you know, I'm all for those movies. But if you kind of have like a, a a separate studio, do your own like Studio Ghibli. You know, mm-hmm. where you start now, where you know once a year you got an animated movie coming out. Even just like the the hand drawn aesthetic, I miss. Like, I remember, do you remember the short Paper Man? I think it was before yeah. Wreck-It Ralph, the first one. Yep. That is one of my, like, favorite Disney animated shorts. It just, like, captured that old, like, timey 50s Disney vibe and look. It was also adorable, but... Oh, yeah. I mean, the art kind of... It kind of reminded me a little bit of um, the the design work. It kind of reminded me of uh, 101 Dalmatians. The humans. I'm not saying the people look, yeah. look like dogs, but but I I think just some of the like just the the character design, it just kind of looked like there's something about that dude's face. I'm like googling it right now. There's something about that face that kind of made me. Yep. Think that, no, like, I see it. The like very tall, lanky characters yeah, with the, right. the exaggerated facial features. Yeah, yeah. It just he looked like. Yeah, he came out of a fucking, 101 Dalmatian. But 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 that that being said, I'm just kind of adding to your point, um, how it just had that classic Disney feel. Mm-hmm. And when did when did Princess and the Frog come out? It's been a it's been a long it was time. Was it 2011, 2012, something like that? I feel like it's got to be longer than that. Princess and the Frog was 2009. All right, so. So it's off. it's been ten years. Damn. And like, has there been another big major like hand drawn animated film that's come out since then? Not that I'm aware of. There's been really cool animated films, but they've all been computer. Like something like Into the Spider Verse, I thought used the medium of animation in a really cool, creative, and amazing way. Right. Which I think is awesome and should keep being done, but I don't know. I miss I miss the like, like the texture. Just like yeah. you can you can feel it. Mm-hmm. No, I agree with all of that, and uh, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully there will be a return to it, um, or at least keep doing it with your Disney one shots or whatever they are, the Disney shorts. Mm-hmm. Even though I think Paperman still was CG, they just did it and like went over it. But whatever. I just I don't know. Do that want... but with your hands. Exactly. And just spend the money, Disney. You just made a fucking ten billion dollars of the Avengers. Yeah. And Spider Man Homecoming and Toy Story Four. You're having a good year. Yeah. Just you know, just you know, to hire some people, get them in a room, give them some pencils. Get to work. <laughs> Get to, yeah. Now. I can't do it, but you can hire me. I'll do something. I'll I'll carry drawings to a machine and scan them. Yeah, I will get everybody coffee. I'll be the coffee yeah, I, bitch. I'm I'll totally be, okay if, with that. If somebody from Disney called me and they're like, hey, do you want to be the coffee bitch for the hand-drawn animation studio? I'd be like, Fuck absolutely. Yeah. I'm quitting my job today. Where do you need me? <laughs> yes. That's that's really all that we need. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. I mean, well, that's all that I need. I want to contribute in some small way, and that's getting you coffee. Hey, it's how Stan Lee started. Stan Lee was a coffee yeah, bitch for Timely. For sure. You know, he just and, clean- he, and he ran everywhere. Yep. I love that. Just knowing mm-hmm. that he literally ran everywhere to get it done faster. <laughs> just, why does that kid s- just keep screaming Excelsior? <laughs> You'll get it one day. <laughs> Speaking of Stanley, did you see the Hot Toys uh, yes, figure? Yes, yes. I I want it so bad, dude. That is am, like the hot toy of all hot toys to get. I it's Stanley in a fucking astronaut outfit from Guardians Volume Two. Mm-hmm. I'm not the figure collector, but that is one where I'm just like, man, if there's any like 
way to memorize like memorialize Stan. That's a pretty good one. Oh yeah. Just sitting in a spacesuit, waving. Yeah. I just love oh my god, I loved the uh his role in that. Oh jeez. Oh guys. I needed a ride. Ah. God rest. I mean, God bless, <laughs> and you rest well, Stanley. Mm-hmm. There's actually a ton of Stanley figures, but I yeah, particularly like this like one. Yeah, but like that Hot Toys <laughs> one, I mean, you can't go wrong. Because, I mean, it's... Yeah, it's just it's just so good. Good stuff. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. It is indeed. Um, but yeah, so that being said, Rob, what have you been up to? Or where, what have you been able to read or watch? Or um, So I've been I've been able to read a, a couple things. Yeah. Um, so today on my train ride home, I read Sea of Stars number one, mm. which is the new image book by Jason Aaron and Dennis Hopeless, so the two writers. Okay. And it has art by Stephen Green who I'm not super familiar with by just his name, but very, very pretty book. Um, But the basic story is it starts with a dad and a son, which I'm already in as somebody who's a dad with a son. I'm an easy get now, but (laughs) (laughs) they're space truckers, or the dad is a space trucker and his son had to come along. And uh, midway through their thing, like their trek, the spaceship gets attacked by this giant space monster thing. And uh, they get separated. The boy thinks the dad was eaten. And then the boy encounters a, like, space monkey and, like, a weird alien whale thing. And it seems like they're going to get into some kind of adventures. And then at the end, you see that the the dad's alive and he's, like, has a tracker on the sun. And he's like, I'm going to find you, son. So it seems like... It seems like it's going to be a book of a, a boy and a couple weird aliens going on adventures, getting into hijinks, and then a dad trying to find a son. Well, and, I'm fucking sold on that. Yeah, the art is gorgeous. Just the way that they capture space is very pretty, very colorful. Um, Jason Aaron seems to like shark-esque creatures in space. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> After, yeah. That's right in from Thor. From Thor and stuff like that. Um, but... Yeah, I'm I'm definitely down, definitely interested. Did Seems Mike like... McNola do the cover for the first issue? He did. That is fucking... Okay, well, you sold me right there. I mean, just the fact that he did, like, a cover for it, but uh, mm-hmm. I'm actually looking at... Uh, I'm looking at it online. Was it Dennis Hollum doing the art? It's beautiful. This is beautiful art. Yeah, it's a very it's a very pretty book. Um, Let me see this. Let me see this Mike McNola cover, the one I had was just the original but yeah it's a good looking book it's fun definitely into that um last week i also read uh the first issue of the captain america from heroes reborn oh the God. infamous giant oh boobed captain God. america story holy shit <laughs> um i was gonna keep reading it but i didn't have time but so it's written or by like, jeff Loeb. yeah art by the one and only rob liefeld <laughs> yeah and uh the the thing that shocked me the most is that it wasn't that terrible. The art of the story. Both. <laughs> um, so I think Rob Liefeld is a horrible pick to draw Captain America. Like just his bony, creepy, small-eyed faces and just the way he draws faces, it just doesn't lend itself to a character that's supposed to be like the embodiment of hope and courage and all that stuff it just they just look slimy and i don't know rob liefeld keep doing you not the best captain america artist <laughs> yeah but the story was kind of interesting i mean it's weirdly unfortunately still relevant where there's like a the world party there's this aryan dude who's like taking all these disaffected white people and basically brainwashing them to be nazis um, and there's a line where Captain America's like, oh, you really think there's still Nazis in the 90s? And I'm like, oh, boy. <laughs> oh, um, you sweet summer child, even though you shouldn't be a sweet summer child. But uh, 
yeah, it's kind of interesting. Every once in a while, I think of Heroes Reborn as the weird, like, failed reboot of the Marvel Universe in the 90s. Kind of the pre-Ultimate Comics, Ultimate Comics. Ugh, yeah. um, and that was after the Onslaught thing, right? Yeah, they kind of used that to, as their, like, kicking off point to reboot the universe. But, yeah, it's just weird having Captain America as kind of like a, almost like a almost like a winter soldier kind of like a brain he's just like working at the dock and he has these dreams of fighting in world war ii dressed as captain america and this old vagrant man's like here i have this shield and then all of a sudden it all comes flooding back to him <laughs> God. um but it was it was an interesting read okay and well if you have marvel unlimited i think it's definitely worth the checking out it's okay. interesting, it's just as like a science project. <laughs> a science project to read. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then also I've been slowly making my way through Neon Genesis Evangelion on Netflix, which I'm sure if anybody who's listening is an anime fan, they've probably already seen it. Um, you know, it's like just one of the most influential, influential famous animes of all time. But it's quite good. I'm a fan. Speaking of like hand drawn animation, it's beautiful. Um, there's a ton of like anime tropes in it that I'm curious if that was like. That's what started it? That's like kind of what started it, or if it's just more of the same. <laughs> so that's why, we, um, yeah, that's why I wanted to ask Jay. Yeah, Jay would probably know. He would totally um, know. But also, just um, it's crazy how much. Guillermo del Toro took from this for Pacific Rim. Like he said, like that was a huge influence on him. Yeah. But it's, it is like that dude must love Evangelion. <laughs> um, but I'm definitely gonna keep, keep reading. I'm a big fan of like mecha giant robots fighting giant monsters type things. And yeah. it's got a pretty cool story. It's like slowly filling in what happened to the world and why there's these giant robots and why for some reason only 14 year olds can pilot these giant things. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, it's on Netflix now. I know weird anime purists are like, oh, the dub is bad or something, but I don't know. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? As long as you're enjoying it, who gives a shit? I am. It's good. It's a good watch randomly throughout the days cool i'll i'll add it to the list but yeah that's kind of it lately cool cool i am um, i am revisiting earth x speaking of an alternate <laughs> alternate alternate timelines yeah. alter alternate alternate <laughs> uh yeah it's great it's great it's uh i think it's something that has aged well um and uh that's something i actually wouldn't mind chatting about for like a future book club someday um because uh yeah it's awesome it's um yeah it's basically it's it's basically it's kind of like marvel's kingdom come um but instead of alex ross doing the art for the comic he's just doing the art for the covers only because earth x is way I, i feel like it's bigger than kingdom come and i loved kingdom come but this was I mean, it's massive. I mean, it's... And I think one of the smart things about this book is that it does a pretty good job of kind of setting up the backstory for all of the big Marvel characters. So it's not like, you you know, if if a newbie were to jump in and read it, you kind of get an intro on, oh, this is Captain America, and this was his journey. And uh, But basically, yeah, it's the the Earth in in the future where basically everyone's a mutant. And... um, yeah, I don't. I, I mean, it's just so good, and, and and I love, I love the black bolt design. Like I love his like helmet, which is like something I hope that they do for a movie someday. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't say that enough good things about the book. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I, I think this would be like a fun book review if if anybody wanted to just kind of hunker down and read it because it, it's it's so good. It's worth the read, and it's just kind of cool to see where you know, these characters end up uh, down the line. Um, and I feel like a lot of things that kind of happened in the um, 
EarthX um, Marvel use, like there being a female Thor, um, you know, Norman Osborn being in charge of things, like um, it, it looks like it kind of it kind of borrowed some uh, Marvel at, at one point, kind of borrowed some of the, some story points from EarthX, but uh, it's so good, so stinking good, um, and I love Cap just being old but still insanely fit with, like, a shaved head and an A carved into his forehead. Fuck. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Cap's a little crazy. I love it. I love it. And I love the villain that he's this powerful psychic. He's so powerful that I think when he was born, Xavier died just because the the energy of it. And he his symbol is he takes the Punisher's skull and spray paints it red so he's, like, a new red skull. It's so fucking good, man. You guys have just got to read it. It's great. Can't say enough things about it. Yeah, it's been like, I don't know, at least ten years since I've read Earth X. Oh, it's worth it's it's worth revisiting because that sounds about. I would say it's been. Oh my god, I think it's been close to twenty years since I've read it. Because I read it in like two thousand or two thousand one, so it's been a long yeah, I mean, fucking came, time. Yeah, it came out in ninety nine, so it's it has been a long time. Yeah, so check it out. Um, saw Spider Man Homecoming. I won't give any spoilers away, but it is fucking great. I don't want to oversell it, but it's fucking great, and I had I'm such so a excited. good time. Such a good time. It's a great way to wrap up Phase Three, which I never thought I, w- I would live to see this day. I remember when, when we were entering Phase 3, and, and with Phase 3, is like the longest of the phases thus far. It's like, what, 10 movies or something like that? I guess. When was, what was the last Phase 2 movie? Iron Man 3? No, last Phase movie was, uh, last Phase 2 movie was Ant-Man. Okay. So you like Cap. Oh, shit, yeah. I mean, all of the Black Panther, Strange stuff, <laughs> Captain Marvel... Just all the new characters, plus all the... There's yeah, so many things, so yeah, many movies. You had Civil War, Doctor Strange, uh, Guardians, Spider-Man, Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, um, Infinity War, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Captain Marvel, uh, Endgame, and Homecoming, or Far From Home. That's like 11 movies. It's stupid. You know what's going to be stupid is the price for the box set. I need to get it. Oh yeah, I, I do too. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm I only it. surprisingly only own like six or seven of the Marvel movies because I think I've always been like, oh, I'll just get the box set. Oh, I'll just get the box set. But then they just keep going and going. Well, you know what I, I think has always been kind of clever is that they've done box sets for like phase for the phases. You can get a phase one box set and a phase two box set. So either we're gonna get a phase three box set or we're gonna get like the fucking mothership of like boxes. I don't know where I was going with that, but it's going to be fucking massive and probably the size of a ship. Um, let me see here. So the phase one, yeah, they have all the different phases. They got, I have like all the Captain America movies. Maybe it's just go on eBay and just buy all the separate Blu-rays. I don't know. It'll be cheaper. Yeah. I don't know, but it's going to be worth it. Your library deserves to have these movies. It's true. If there's mm-hmm. anything I need, it's just the ability to watch Captain America every single day of my life. Oh, yeah. That's why I also have them on digital, too. So, you know, if I'm on the road, it's like, man, you know what I could use right now is some Winter Soldier. Watch it on my phone. Yep. And that's all I got to say. But, as always, thank you so much for listening. Um, don't forget to check out our website, graphicmultiverse.com. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, you know where to find us. And as the words, in the words of a wise Jedi, Will Carry, enjoy your issues. Mm-hmm.